Member statements. The member for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Yeah, thanks, Speaker. Um, Speaker, uh, under the new leadership of uh, President and CEO Julie Caffin and Board Chair James Eastwood, Brockville General Hospital is in good hands. But today I want to go back to 2017, when our cherished community hospital was struggling. Enter Nick Vlacolius as President and CEO and Jim Cooper as Board Chair. Brockville General's transformation since then into one of the best hospitals anywhere is remarkable. We've opened a new tower and we're planning on our next redevelopment. Instead of closing programs, uh, we opened a new MRI. And pediatric surgeries have returned thanks to an investment from our government and a partnership with CHEO. The transformation is a testament to the hard work of the board, of the volunteers and staff, all made possible by Nick and Jim's leadership and commitment to communication, staff well-being, and patient care. Speaker, uh, Nick's impact goes beyond the Brockville General Hospital. His financial insights helped me make the case to our government to fix the hospital's funding formula, stabilizing operations at medium-sized hospitals across Ontario. Earlier this year, Jim's term as board chair ended. And today, Nick begins a new chapter in his career at London Health Sciences Centre. The member for uh, Elgin Middlesex London is so fortunate to have him speaker. To the dynamic duo of Nick and Jim, I want to say thank you. Your legacy is stronger for BGH, one that is ready to be there for patients and families for generations to come. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. This weekend, the Hope Centre Open Arms Mission and Salvation Army hosted their annual food drive at, in Welland at Club Richelieu. On Saturday, I stopped by to thank the 500 volunteers and community members who came together to help sort donations. They've already raised an impressive $32,000 and are hoping to reach $35,000 by the end of the month. According to recent statistics, one in 10 Welland residents accessed a food bank within the last year. 30% of those were children. The need in Welland has never been greater due to a combination of factors, most notably the increase in cost of living in this province, making life less and less affordable, including the price of rent, utilities, and groceries. Jennifer Sinclair, Community Engagement Coordinator for the Hope Centre in Welland, recently spoke to the media about the crisis, stating, our numbers are just skyrocketing. There's been about a 100% increase since last year. Speaker, local food banks, once a temporary resource, have now become essential for many citizens in Welland and in many places across the province. This government is failing to deliver on the basics, including social service funding that has been frozen for up to three years. This province needs to step up now to help those struggling with the basics like housing, health care and groceries. We can do better. Member Statements. The member for Brampton East. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'm very excited, to, uh, very excited today because I have great news for Bramptonians. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government's committed to building the inf great infrastructure that Ontario needs and the infrastructure that Brampton needs, Speaker. And as a result, we're proud to announce that William Osler, Osler Health Systems has officially released their request for proposals on the conversion of Peel Memorial Hospital into Brampton's second full-service hospital, Speaker. In partnership with Infrastructure Ontario, this announcement makes it one step closer to start early works in construction and, bring, and start construction by spring of 2025. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, Brampton will never again be left behind. We've seen more investment from this government in the past six years than the previous government's decade in power, Speaker. And with, the, and with this Premier at the helm, we're going to continue to deliver for the residents of Brampton and Ontario as Ontario recognizes the, the need to build priority highways faster faster, reduce gridlock as our, as, our, as our province continues to flourish and grow, Speaker. That's why our government introduced Bill 212, uh, reducing gridlock and saving you time act. That includes the removal of bike lanes in high traffic areas, reducing gridlock and making it easier for people to commute around this province, Speaker. And our work doesn't end there. We're also making the largest investment in public transit in Ontario's history with the Mississauga Loop, the Brampton LRT and new subways being built in Toronto. We're expanding public 
public transit like Ontario's never seen before, Speaker. And we're saving money, we're making it more affordable to use public transit with the introduction of one fare, saving transit riders up to $1,600 a year, Speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next member statement, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Everyone should be able to count on government to protect our vehicles, but across Ontario, people are experiencing auto theft every day. Car thieves are gaming the system to get new VINs for stolen vehicles at Service Ontario counters. Other provinces are taking action to protect their VIN registries, but Ontario is leaving criminals a significant loophole. Four years. This government has been advised by law enforcement and insurance experts to prevent revinning. <laughs> Ford's announcement of more reactive penalties does little to close the loophole and protect the legitimacy of our VIN registry. We need a dedicated strategy for Service Ontario to investigate VINs to ensure every vehicle on the road is legitimate. That's the kind of proactive solution that New Democrats bring to the table. Why is this government incapable of being proactive to guard the integrity of Ontario's VIN database? The PCs could reach for solutions and suggestions, but instead they're focused on penalties after the crime. This government must reassure drivers that we have a strong system, an audit process, and a database that won't allow criminals to get stolen vehicles into our system and so easily legitimized. While other jurisdictions are tackling this, Ontario is hiding its head in the glove box and turning our province into an express lane for VIN fraud. Ontario is becoming a destination for car thieves. We deserve better. We have to get serious about auto theft. I'm calling on this government to get it in here and protect our VINs. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next member statement, the member for Milton. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Yesterday, I had the honor of attending a touching remembrance tray uh, ceremony at Haltonville War Memorial in the former township of Nasagawe and my riding of Milton. As we gathered to pay tribute, we reflected on the immense sacrifices made by those who fought valiantly in the Great Wars and the Korean War. I've attended Remembrance Day events before, both as a private citizen and as a Milton councillor, but attending on behalf of the province of Ontario and placing the wreath was a uniquely emotional experience. This solemn occasion reminds us of the courage and resilience displayed by our servicemen and women who selflessly dedicated their lives to protect our freedom. Each name inscribed on the memorial stands for a story of bravery, loss and love echoing through generations. I wanted to dedicate my statement today not just to the men who came from Nasagawea and sacrificed their lives, but all brave men and women across Ontario and our great nation of Canada, whether they come back home or not. Let us not only remember their courage and sacrifice, but let's also commit to upholding the values they fought for. Peace, democracy, and freedom. Today we honour the legacy by ensuring their stories live on in our hearts and in our actions. Lest we forget. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. Today I rise to honour our veterans, the men and women who have served, those who have been wounded, those who made the ultimate sacrifice, active service members and all of their families. Many of us will attend services in our communities. In Hamilton, the inaugural Veterans Day service will be held November the 8th at the Eagles Among Us Monument at Battlefield Park in Stony Creek. I'm honoured to be attending as current and past Indigenous sacrifices will be shared of this land and will be reflected on. On November the 10th, the parade in, of Hamilton veterans, garrison units and cadet corps will leave John Foote VC armories and proceed to Veterans Place, a cenotaph at Gore Park. It is an honour to be a part of the garrison parade and service remembering our veterans and peacekeepers. On November 11th, we will honour our veterans at the Canadian Legion Branch 163 in Hamilton Mountain Remembrance Day services. I am proud of the on, my ongoing commitment to our veterans in our communities. With many veterans returning home, they are faced with many barriers. Accessing health care, mental health care, stable housing, employment services and programs that help them on their healing journey. 
we must not lose sight of the importance to protect our veterans as they have protected us and our freedoms. We are grateful for many veterans and active service members who engage in community service and educate and encourage our future generations. You teach through your actions the importance of resilience, of camaraderie, and that we must help one another in times of need. Your bravery, courage, and sacrifices will always be remembered, lest we forget. Thank you very much. The next member statement, the member for Oxford. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today marks the start of Remembrance Week. Mr. Speaker, it is an honour to commemorate the brave men and women who currently serve, have served, or have sacrificed their lives for our country. I had the pleasure of attending two Armour's Day dinners over the weekend in Beachville and Woodstock, and I'm always humbled to see the love our veterans have for Canada. One of the enduring symbols of Remembrance Day is the poppy, immortalizing, immortalized in Canadian Lieutenant Colonel John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields, which was written during the First World War. As we wear the poppy on our left lapel over the heart, it reminds us of the cost of war, but it also the duty of the living to carry the legacy of those who have fallen. It also shows how Remembrance Day will always be linked to the Great War. When it was first observed in 1919 as Armistice Day dinner, as Armistice Day, it was to commemorate the armistice agreement between Germany and the Allied powers that went into effect on the 11th of November, 1918, at 11 a.m. In 1931, the Canadian government changed the name to Remembrance Day to emphasize that we should remember the fallen soldiers of all conflicts, including those of the First World War. On November the 11th, Mr. Speaker, we sh let us remember those who served, those who sacrificed, and those who continue to protect the values that we hold dear by wearing a poppy and donating to the local legion, lest we forget. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Member statements. Member Statements, the member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, everybody knows about the incredible investments being made in the automotive industry in the province of Ontario, and these investments are going to be a boon not only for manufacturers, but also in the mining industry, especially in the area of critical minerals. But it also means that older, older manufacturing processes are going to go away and we're going to have new ones and that means job disruption. Workers have to adapt. And there's a great union that's going to help them adapt and that union is called Unifor. Unifor is helping its members upskill and retrain, teaching them new skills such as battery chemistry, process overview, lean manufacturing, mechanical machinery, electronics, pneumatics, and robotics. That's a great, a great training program for the members of this union, Mr. Speaker, and it's all made possible in a partnership between Unifor and the Government of Ontario, which has provided a grant in the amount of $955,000 to help retrain auto workers. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Premier and I want to thank the Minister of Labour for providing this great program that's helping men and women in uniform retrain and build the mighty auto industry in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last month, I had the privilege of attending an announcement at the Centre for Skills Development in my riding of Burlington. Alongside the Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity, we highlighted the Women's Economic Security Program, which equips women with the training needed to increase workforce participation and achieve financial independence. I witnessed firsthand the incredible partnerships between women-centred organizations, educational institutions, and local businesses that make this program possible. This initiative has already empowered thousands of women to start businesses and advance their education and training. 
I'm excited to announce that our government is investing up to $1.18 million over the next three years in the Centre for Skills Development. This investment will help the Women's Economic Security Program with a specific focus on enhanced general carpentry training. Investing in programs like these breaks down barriers and builds a future where diversity drives progress and innovation. Thanks to this government investment, we are fostering a skilled workforce that can meet the work, the, 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 the demands of our growing industries, impacting both the current labour force and future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our member's statements for this morning.